tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Um, unfortunately, we late last night, we made the decision to postpone the event. Two, one. Major events in Vancouver hit by fears of coronavirus also. Well, this is no joy for the family today. This is just one more step in the journey. Gabriel Klein guilty of second degree murder in the death of Letitia Reimer at her Abbotsford High School. And I bet that this is probably one of the coolest towers that we have across the country. 903 Arbor Tower. Inside Harbor Tower. 007 Squawk 3. One of Metro Vancouver's secret spaces. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. Coronavirus fears are now having a big impact on major events in Metro Vancouver. An annual fundraising gala for BC's Children's Hospital scheduled for tomorrow night has been postponed. And a festival to celebrate Persian New Year later this month in West Van has been cancelled. Organizers of other events are taking steps to contain the spread of the virus. Our John Hernandez is live at Rogers Arena tonight where fans are arriving for the Vancouver Canucks game. So John, what can those fans expect to see at the rink tonight? Yeah, as you can see, this game is going ahead as planned, but there are precautions being taken here at Rogers Arena. For one, they've added many more hand sanitizing stations in the building, and they've also ramped up their cleaning staff. As you mentioned, there have been some cancellations for events across Metro Vancouver. Today, I spoke with organizers who had to make some very tough decisions. We decided to cancel for the safety and security of the public. Davud Gavalmi had been planning West Vancouver's Persian New Year Festival for months. The beloved event takes place every March and features this dazzling fire festival. It provides like happiness and happy environment to the people welcoming to the Nauru's and it was just a national celebration. Thousands were expected this year, but concerns of the coronavirus forced organizers to cancel. It was a very difficult decision because it's lots of volunteer involved lots of money involved in this case so i think for the sake of the, the sake of the public it was the right decision to do it in vancouver tomorrow night's annual gala organized by the bc children's hospital foundation was called off at the last minute we prioritize the health, safety and peace of mind of our guests. And while we recognize that the risk to British Columbians is low of COVID-19, we were getting um, increasing feedback from both um, guests and volunteers about their concern. The event was set to kick off a $5 million fundraising campaign, now indefinitely postponed. We're in uncharted territories. I think that right now we're really trying to regroup and figure out what those next steps look like. But the big event in town this weekend, the sold-out Rugby Sevens at BC Place, is expected to carry on. Organizers are urging fans to practice safe hygiene. The province says these mass gatherings are safe, but to stay away if you're sick. Those who are passionate about rugby, as uh, you and I are, uh, attend if you have tickets, uh, good for you. Uh, but if you're ill, uh, stay home. It, it, it's not just work we're talking about, it is public gatherings. If you're not well, you should not co-mingle with your neighbours uh, and with uh, fellow citizens. Now, there have been some major cancellations across North America today, the biggest being the South by Southwest Music Festival in Austin, Texas. That won't go ahead next weekend as planned. Now, as for some other events a bit further down the line, like the Vancouver Sun Run and the Boston Marathon, those will stay the course, at least for now. Mike? All right, John Hernandez, live at Rogers Arena tonight. Thanks. Now, if you are planning on taking transit to any of the events John was talking about, TransLink has been stepping up its cleaning procedures on SkyTrains in preparation. Every night we are cleaning and disinfecting all SkyTrain cars. It's a thorough clean. It involves a wipe down of surfaces, sills, window ceilings, a mop down, and that's using a disinfectant product. On top of daily cleanings, the entire fleet of sea buses and regular buses have been sprayed down with a strong disinfectant. And tonight the province is ramping up its response measures to deal with the increasing number of coronavirus cases. The plan includes expanding the number of testing sites and new labs up and running next week. A special panel has been gathered to advise government on how to best deal with the outbreak. 
Part of its efforts will be exploring options for employees to work from home. British Columbians can have every confidence that everything we can do is being done. And we're going to continue to increase testing capacity uh, as uh, we see an increase potentially of, of the outbreak uh, making its way to British Columbia. Oregon says BC has been a world leader in its response to the virus and precautions are in place if the outbreak lasts for up to four months. And global infections of coronavirus continue to mount tonight. Tiny Vatican City, the latest nation to report its first case. Nazima Walji has more on the global struggle to work together and contain the virus. There's fresh urgency for a global effort to contain the disease from spreading further as the number of coronavirus cases across the world pushes past the 100,000 mark. Governments can prepare their health workers to detect, test, treat and care for patients. The head of the World Health Organization is reinforcing the importance of working together. Every day we slow down the epidemic is another day closer to having vaccines and therapeutics. In Iran, the numbers continue to surge. In Italy, even Vatican City was hit by the virus, confirming its first case. As the second hardest hit country, South Korea continues to report more illnesses and deaths, which has prompted other countries to impose travel restrictions. Japan said it would quarantine all travelers arriving from the neighboring country. South Korea responded by halting all visa waivers for Japan and imposing special entry procedures for any foreigners arriving from Japan. Such measures, say World Health Organization doctors, won't help. We challenge countries who put in place travel restrictions and we challenge them to provide the public health uh, evidence. They've both scaled up their public health operations. They're saving lives and I think we should focus on that uh, and not necessarily on uh, political spats over travel restrictions. On the other front, there's a global push to study the new coronavirus and to develop a vaccine. Today, Canada's health minister announced $27 million over two years for COVID research. I think this is going to make a huge difference for Canadians, but not just Canadians, for the global understanding of this severe public health uh, issue. In the U.S., President Donald Trump signed an emergency bill for $8.3 billion U.S. dollars, money for vaccines, tests and potential treatments as they prepare to respond. You have to be calm. It'll go away. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison has created a $1 billion fund as they struggle to contain the spread. This is about dealing with the coronavirus. As I keep saying, we are all in this together. As global efforts continue in the potentially long-drawn fight against the rapidly spreading virus. Nazima Walji, CBC News, Toronto. And we will have more on the COVID-19 outbreak, including why not to go to an emergency ward if you suspect you might have the virus. That's coming up later in this newscast. The man accused of stabbing a 13-year-old girl to death at her Abbotsford High School has been found guilty of second-degree murder. Gabriel Klein was 21 years old when he attacked Letitia Reimer. CBC's Jason Proctor was in court when the verdict was read. The attendance at Gabriel Klein's trial has been sparse for the most part, but the public gallery was packed today with friends and family of 13-year-old Letitia Reimer wearing black T-shirts with the words Abby Strong written in red letters on the front. Before Associate Chief Justice Heather Holmes read her ruling, a sheriff asked them to cover up the T-shirts to maintain the court's impartiality. We want to protect the, 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 the gentle nature of, of the uh, criminals and completely leave out the rights of the family and friends uh, and supporters to, to grieve in the way they want to. Gabriel Klein stabbed Reimer 14 times, killing her, and stabbed her friend four times, gravely wounding her. He acknowledged his guilt on account of aggravated assault. But Klein, who has been diagnosed with schizophrenia since the attacks, claimed that he should be found guilty of manslaughter, not second-degree murder because of mental issues. But as she went through the facts of the case, Holmes examined Klein's strange behavior and noises both before and after the killing, finding that he may have been mentally disturbed, but that he still acted with purpose and was capable of forming the intent to kill and to understand the consequences of his actions. 
She convicted Klein of one count of second-degree murder and one count of aggravated assault. I think he was ready for it. I, mean, I think he appreciated the variable nature of the evidence and the potential consequences of this result. He'll get a life sentence regardless, but a hearing will be held in early June to determine the length of time before Klein is eligible for parole. A family spokesperson said Letitia Reimer's family was pleased with the verdict. I think this is just one more step in the journey and uh, the decisions with what could have been made here today, the, the most extreme, I guess, uh, ruling has been made. Now we'll wait to see what the uh, sentencing uh, does to uh, support the, uh, what, what the judge ruled today but described it as the best outcome of an absolutely terrible situation. Jason Proctor, CBC News, New Westminster. A large cache of weapons, some real, some fake, have been seized from a home near Oppenheimer Park in Vancouver. Handmade weapons, imitation guns, swords, hatchets, and a stun baton. The UPD says Wednesday's discovery is the third weapon seizure in the area in nine days. first glance, looking at the handguns, we wouldn't know that they're imitation. These knives are very real and they're very dangerous. So people need to be aware, take caution in that area, and to notify the police if they do see anything. Police say the recent spike of seizures is unusual and caution increased gang activity means there may be more in the area. Weekend is here, mm -hmm. just about. Just about, a few about. hours to yes, go, I yes. think. Well, uh, some people have already started, no doubt. They have. Oh, yes, well, and uh, what is this going to mean for us weather-wise? Well, did you like today, by the way? Yeah, very nice. Beautiful, Classic yeah. day. This is what we're going to be expecting, I think, largely for Sunday. Okay. But tomorrow, there's just that little chance, I mentioned a bit earlier this week, mm. might get a little bit of the snow coming. And I want to show you this right now on some of our maps. Let's take a wide look right now. Satellite and radar, one thing we definitely noticed was, well, relatively, the lack of cloud across much of the south coast today and you're seeing that right there and many other places across BC experiencing similar conditions and our current temperatures starting to cool down going back down to about five degrees at the airport from our daytime highs today we ended up getting up to 10 degrees and nowhere in BC by the way was the warmest spot in the country that was in southern Alberta today where they got up to 17 degrees so we were a far cry away from that but yeah if you've got some plans this weekend I'm gonna walk you through what you can be expecting over the next few hours Largely into the pre-dawn hours tomorrow, we're going to be dealing with a few showers, and you'll notice that those low temperatures going down to about one degree or so. That means come Saturday morning, there is that realistic chance for a bit of a rain-snow mix and then clearing by the afternoon. At Sunday, as I alluded to a little bit earlier, that is going to be the day to be watching. And you know what also happens on Sunday? Oh, yes. That's right. We get to spring forward. We're losing an hour of sleep, but we're gaining a good hour in our sunset. Going yes. to be pretty cool, right? As long as we don't say the days are getting longer. Exactly. They're staying the same. They're the exact same. We're just shifting our clocks. <laughs> All right. Now, you, sir, are mm. a relatively newish arrival yeah. to, to these parts. Yeah. It's been a year or so. Yeah, or? You're coming up a year, yeah, actually. Up a year. <laughs> so I think you're going to appreciate this, All right. this next story. Uh, they are places or spaces you likely haven't seen before, okay. or maybe you've heard about them mm. but have never been. Perhaps they're not even accessible to the public. Well, tonight we begin a new series on CBC Vancouver News at 6. These are Metro Vancouver's Secret Spaces. Harbor Tower at Sully Jet 717, IFR Vancouver Departure 338 to Victoria. They speak a different language way up there. Hello, just 717 13005 ultimate 3050, clear takeoff from Heliport. High above Vancouver Harbor. Squawk 3020. 3051 is 3020, thanks. Talk about an office with a view. This is a very cool place to work. Uh, I haven't been to all of NAF Canada's towers, of course, but I would uh, I'd bet that this is probably one of the coolest towers that we have across the country. Not surprisingly, it's a coveted destination for air traffic controllers. It is a very, very unique place. Uh, we are one of the tallest control towers in the world, uh, and the business that we do here is awesome. That business involves ensuring the safe movement of aircraft in the airspace in and around the harbor. When the weather is, is lower, um, most BFR operators, people who operate their aircraft with reference to, uh, to the ground, 
um, they might not choose to go out however Harbour Air and Helijet are running commercial operations and so they will still go out so that creates a challenge in the winter where we have less traffic but it's more complex making sure that they have adequate space between them uh, in, in periods of low weather. Traffic at your three o'clock one mile a southbound order at 1600 type and altitude unverified. We're responsible here in this tower for uh, a volume of airspace from approximately the second narrows out towards Point Agonson, Point Grey and then back along False Creek uh, up to 2,500 feet and uh, during our hours of operation which is limited to, to uh, uh, either s uh, 6 o'clock in the evening or, or half hour past sunset whichever is later. Um, it's basically daylight hours and in that time we're responsible uh, for the safe movement of aircraft through this airspace. Getting up here requires an elevator and some walking. And you've got this fancy staircase to get up and down. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, the staircase, uh, I don't imagine that uh, would be allowed anymore <laughs> if we were to build a new tower, right. um, but it is a very interesting uh, piece of uh, architecture that we can enjoy. The spiral staircase, just one of the things that makes this a special place. Harbour Tower, good afternoon, cleared to third beach 1000 in the zone approved number one. It is uh, very unique in that it, uh, it is not a standalone control tower. Um, I, I believe that there's a record somewhere else in the world for, for the tallest tower there, but we are the highest control tower above the surface that we're, we're served, so we're approximately 465 feet above sea level right now. Uh, and that definitely makes it for a very unique place. We have a top-down view of our operating areas and a very uh, unique perspective on where the traffic is. A unique perspective. Golf Yankee Juliet Juliet Harbor Tower, good afternoon. On one of BC's busiest airports. <laughs> that think, is so cool. Yeah, right? and I, I think it's fair to say but most people don't even know it's it's up there. Absolutely, have or they no may idea. look up there and go, what the, what is that? Yeah. yeah, but that view alone, I mean, yeah. talk about an office view. That was the best line, Matt. That's yeah. so cool. Yeah, <laughs> it's a very very nice space. Amazing. Okay. So next week, secret mm -hmm. space is uh, continues. We're going to be over on the North Shore in Lower Seymour Conservation Forest. Uh, I'll just give you a little hint. The secret okay. space involves a tunnel. Ooh, not like many tunnels. people actually know about. This is great. It's I love it. Up Keep it coming. Up, coming up next <laughs> week. And just a quick reminder, CBC Vancouver is on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. And you can watch this newscast live on CBC Gem. The free app is also where you can find other CBC programs. Well, they call them man camps. What they are and why they have some Kitimat residents worried about women's safety. That's next. And thanks for staying with us through the commercial break where we are ad-free on our live streams. Well, the sari has been worn by South Asian women for centuries, mm -hmm. really. Something one Toronto area woman has been on a mission to modernize, and she's turned it into a full-time job. Nana Abaduncan spoke to Tia Buva about where it all started and how it led her to create what she calls yoga pants <laughs> for saris. As I was shooting these pictures, um, because I wasn't really moving around, I was just posing for a picture, I would wear yoga pants under the sari. And I was comfortable, it wasn't something I dreaded. And my husband, who unwillingly, but I convinced him to take these pictures, would always ask me, why don't you just wear the yoga pants to these weddings and these events that you never like wearing the regular underskirt to? And I was like, well, that's not gonna work because the yoga pants has a wide band and as soon as you tuck a sari in, um, it'll come undone as soon as you start moving. So he was like, well, why don't you just get a skirt in the same material that has a drawstring waist and then you can just wear that. And it didn't exist. So I created it. This is what my grandma, my mom, and a lot of women of today wear. Okay. Um, it's one size fits all, but it flatters no one. What that skirt does is it allows you to have a good base to work with so that no matter what drape you do on top with the sari, it... And the silhouette is important, isn't it? It's so important. I'm wearing this beautiful color, I love it, and I get it, like it feels really comfortable. I would wear this on my own, just like around the house. But what I'm really interested in is this drawstring. It's really strong and I imagine that's very important. It's so important. So it's basically holding together six yards of fabric and we're going to do it in the Nivy drape, which is very popular in the South, but if you were to Google a picture of a sari, um, the Nivy drape is what will come up. So it's pleats in the front, very similar to those two, pleats in the front with, a, um, with the end of the fabric over your left shoulder. Yes, I do. Okay.
Oh my gosh, it's amazing. I love it. I absolutely love it. People who are not South Asian buying this. Yes. A lot of them message me to say, hey, would it be wrong for me to wear a sari? Would it be wrong for me to purchase from you? And, and my personal opinion is that if they're taking the time to research and, you know, follow someone like me who I, you know, show the drapes, like buying a sari and draping it like a toga and going to a toga party, that would be disrespectful. But taking the time to really understand how to wear the garment, what the garment is about, what its history is, what its significance is, and, you know, just educating themselves before wearing, I think that is the most respect you can give any culture or any tradition. The CBC's Nana Abamankin reporting there. And we're having more on our domestic violence series coming up in just a couple of seconds. Stay with us. And now to our series on domestic violence in Canada tonight. CBC News is investigating intimate partner violence. Here in BC, shelters in Kitimat say they've been overwhelmed by women fleeing abusive situations. As Michelle Gassoub reports, they say the surge coincides with the arrival of thousands of workers for LNG Canada. Kitimat is a small town hosting BC's biggest natural resource project. Since LNG Canada came to town, so have thousands of workers. For two years now, the town's shelter for women fleeing violence has been so full, they've turned away dozens of women and their children. If all nine beds are full, we are over capacity. Uh, and so we have been at or over capacity most nights of the year for the last two or three years. One of the reasons is a surge in the cost of housing. And with most industry jobs going to men, a massive increase in the income gap between men and women. Now, if you're turned away from the shelter here in Kitimat, there aren't that many options for you. If you can't stay with family or friends, you could try the cold weather shelter. But that's not open all year round, and it also can't accommodate children. That means your next best bet would be to drive 45 minutes to the next town of Terrace, but the shelter there tells us they're often full too. City Councillor Jessica McCallum-Miller used to work in that Terrace women's shelter. She's worried about more than just violence between intimate partners. As a young Indigenous woman, I'm actually facing some stalking violence in my community. I've been harassed uh, by unknown men, not from this community. I don't know if they're working for industry. I don't know who they are. And uh, I'm, I'm facing it as well. It's a story researcher Leah Levac knows well. She studies the safety of women in towns hosting projects like LNG. It is certainly the case that when we speak with women, both Heisla and settler women in this community, they will flag that their perception of increased instances of sort of feeling unsafe are connected to this sort of influx of, uh, of people. LNG Canada says it knows projects like theirs can make women feel unsafe. For that reason, they're housing all their workers outside of town, but dispute that what some people call man camps are dangerous. The view that these are just um, cauldrons of, of testosterone and these men are out to get the women, I think is wrong. Uh, we want people to be safe. We want women to be safe, Indigenous people to be safe. Most people say that's a step in the right direction. Then it's on to the next question, how to make sure Kitimat stays safe if boom eventually turns to bust. Michelle Gassoub, CBC News, Kitimat. And you can read more stories from all across the country at cbc.ca slash stopping domestic violence. You'll find a link on that page to crisis lines in every province and territory. But as always, as you know, if you're in an immediate danger situation and need help, call 911. And for further assistance and resources in your area, visit sheltersafe.ca or endingviolencecanada.org. Well, this week we have shared stories about a health sick man and his granddaughter who were handcuffed while trying to open a bank account in Vancouver. And the visit several senior bosses of the Bank of Montreal made to Bella Bella to witness a healing ceremony. 
But as Angela Sterrett reports, the incident also stirred emotions and conversations in the community at large. Maxwell Johnson's Bella Bella community knows him best as an artist. Last year, he took this on, the front of the big house that now sits at the center of the community. But earlier this year, the world came to know him as the man who was handcuffed while trying to open a bank account for his granddaughter. The incident shook this tight-knit community. Tori Ann's, she's involved in the culture and, you know, she's a bright young lady and, you know, Max is like a cultural leader and he's a big part of our community. So it was really disappointing to see that, you know, they would treat them like that. For youth like Wilson, it sent a chill for those who enjoy going to the city. We know that we're going to eventually leave the community and it, it, I think it scares some of us and it's just like, oh, are we going to get treated like that? The coastal community jumped into action to not dwell on fear, but to focus on healing. It was so traumatic for, for Max and Tori and their family, but also for the whole community to witness from afar and sort of to have this moment where we can begin to approach closure and really demonstrate to Max the kind of community care that I think we all trust exists, but to show him that it's there, I think that was really important. The story, while troubling, broke open conversations across the country. We see, you know, definitely a lot of racism within within the country, and even more so with things that are happening right now, you know, as we speak. And I think that um, understanding that history of colonization and modern day racism is critical, she says. As for Max, my heart's not heavy anymore. Um, I feel more stable, stronger. Their story went really far, and I think it went far for a reason to just educate Canada that, you know, it's not, it's not right that they can treat First Nations people like that. And it's not over just yet. Johnson is still filing a human rights case against the Vancouver Police Department and the Bank of Montreal. Angela Sterrett, CBC News, Bella Bella. As the global coronavirus crisis deepens, another cruise ship is caught up in the mess. The latest on the Grand Princess and the fate of hundreds of Canadians on board, next. When you step on the gas, you're going to start sliding. Ross Rebliati had to start somewhere. And where better to start than in the hands of Oral Tahara, a 27-year-old who has a missionary zeal for each flock of new converts. Good job. They love it. They've tried it once. You know, maybe one of their friends have introduced it to them, and they've gotten the bug. Ten years ago, snowboarding didn't even exist. Now, half the people on this mountain are on a board. There's no question snowboarding is incredibly popular. It may also be incredibly perilous. Hey, here he is. Okay, well, it was the Golden Boys' triumphant victory at the 98 Olympics that started it all. You can see snowboarding has left the fringe to become mainstream. It feels like you're one with the snowboard and like you're really like you're a lot closer to the ground and you can like really move with the mountain really well. If that's too zen for you, there's one big difference between boarding and skiing. Probably like the biggest one I notice is when you when you fall. Yeah, this it hurts when you fall when you're boarding. Boarders call this big air. Doctors have another name for it. This would be called a burst fracture and it's from landing on your butt. According to a recent VGH study, the risks are significant. The study found that the rate of spinal injuries among snowboarders is four times higher than skiers. It's not the guy who's out on a board the first time and out on a bunny hill. You know, these are, these are very athletic, aggressive, young male boarders. And uh, their injuries are, are very severe. Here at Cyprus, borders account for 55% of the people on the hill, but they account for 68% of the injuries. Oral, who's also a racer, is dressed like a hockey player. Um, knee pads, in case you know, we get the icy conditions. Um, for good reason. Oral's highlight reel from last year includes... Strained knee, probably partially torn ligaments. 
um, partially compressed vertebrae in my lower back and my upper neck, three concussions, eight stitches, separated clavicle, torn shoulder, and I love every minute of it. Back to David. He doesn't wear knee pads, elbow pads, or a helmet. Do you ever worry about getting hurt? Sometimes. Like, I used to wear a helmet, but it got too small, so I don't wear it anymore. We could come stairs. Many blame the injuries on the glamorization of boarding in videos and commercials. Some, like the BC Injury Prevention Centre, are fighting fire with fire. Attention snowboarders, welcome to the friendly skies of big air. With snazzy radio ads promoting safety. The hills also encourage lessons, but of those injured... A lot of them haven't taken lessons. Back on the bunny hill, Oral makes sure the kids get the message. You see people, they're, you know, getting big air, you know, it's all fun and everything like that, but they don't show the downside, you know, that, yes, injuries do happen. Uh, if you don't take the right precautions, you can get hurt. You learn how to slow down, stop. Sage advice, because soon enough, this group will join the hunt for big air. Hopefully, they won't find big pain. For CBC News, I'm Duncan McHugh. With more and more cases of COVID-19 popping up in BC, the province is unveiling its plans for a pandemic. Greg Rasmussen tells us what's involved and has the reaction. Today, BC unveiled its plan to fight the outbreak. It's a very challenging virus to, um, to be able to contain and we've seen that globally. So far, the province has 21 confirmed cases, including one patient in intensive care. One case in particular is troubling because so far, it can't be traced back to any of the earlier infections. It has officials scrambling, tracking the woman's history, looking for the source. And that investigation is obviously one that we're watching very carefully, and there's been a lot of uh, um, detailed disease detective work being done in the last 24 hours. Across the border in Washington state, three new deaths were confirmed, bringing the total to 14. After a staff member tested positive, this university told its 46,000 students and staff to stay home. Classes and exams will now be done remotely. So many people are staying home in Seattle, commute times have been cut in half. In Vancouver, some things are going ahead as 70,000 fans and players from 16 countries converge on BC Play Stadium for the World Rugby Sevens. This ticket reseller says some people are staying away. It looks like the local numbers are coming. Uh, we have no issues there. It's just that a lot of international groups have cancelled. A growing number of events are being put on hold, including a large hospital fundraiser. We were getting um, increasing feedback from both um, guests and volunteers about their concern. The B.C. government says it's preparing for things to get worse, setting up a new task force. We live in an interdependent world, as all of you know, and there are aspects of this that we simply do not and cannot control, and that's why we have to be prepared. If and only if things get considerably worse, the government could invoke its powers to restrict travel, ensure there's food on store shelves, and reallocate health care resources. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. And as the province prepares for the spread of the virus, do you know what to do if you think you might be infected? Well, your first impulse might be to head to the nearest emergency ward, but David Common shows us why that is a very bad idea. In extreme cases, those with COVID-19 would end up like this. But unless you're this sick, many physicians don't want you anywhere near a hospital. Because COVID-19 sparks a fear of I'm going to die or this is something really serious, they become alarmed and they want to be reassured and so they show up at our department. The problem with that is that they put others at risk. Emergency doctor Lori Mazurek even started a petition urging authorities to set up off-site testing. I think there's 1,444, which I suppose is not bad for less than three days, but uh, I think it would be amazing if Canada signed it and all the people of Canada said, hey, you know what, we want to protect these people. Something she believes should already be in place now, so those with mild symptoms are kept away from those most vulnerable. There are limited efforts now to have the testing done elsewhere. 
Toronto's Michael Guerin Hospital is setting up a dedicated clinic. So if yeah. they're worried just about COVID-19 and they just need to get screened, we're helping, working with our family health team and community partners across the street uh, yeah. to go and get tested. There. So it's an off-site location. That's off the idea. Site. Testing can happen there. That's right. The new facility set to test up to 150 people a day is the only one announced so far in Ontario. The province says planning for more could be in place for next week. This hospital believes the timing is right. There has uh, been very limited uh, number of cases in Ontario right now. So to have built these a month ago wouldn't have made sense in terms of the need in the community. As we start to see uh, the number of cases increase in Ontario, we want to really be prepared in case there is further growth. So why not just have a family physician conduct this test? Well, in part because the test involves putting a Q-tip all the way up your nose and that can prompt some people to cough. If they are infected, that could be a problem to the person administering the test who now likely needs to wear not just a mask, but a face shield something many family physicians just don't have on hand. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. And tonight, at least 230 Canadians must be wishing they'd made different travel plans. They are among the 3,500 passengers forced to stay on a cruise ship off the coast of California. Aaron Collins is in San Francisco tonight with the latest on the situation there. It's not a cruise anyone would sign up for. Stuck at sea for an anxious wait, followed by medical tests with bad results. Among those tested, 46 persons were swabbed. Uh, 21 uh, of those on the ship tested positive for the coronavirus. Paratroopers dropped off the test kits yesterday. This ship singled out after it emerged that California's first COVID-19 fatality had been a passenger in February. And today, fresh worries that a second former passenger may have died on land and that others are seriously ill. So the rush to find and test former passengers is happening across California. We are planning to contact all people who got off the ship who are residents of San Francisco, um, and we'll get back to, pe with people, to those people to inform them that if they should consult with their health care provider. Back on that ship, the positive results mean their journey is far from over. It's kind of a little bit disturbing being out here in the open seas, just, you know, barely f***ing along. We're just going in circles. Um, and not knowing how long we're going to be out here. But those answers should be coming soon. We have developed a plan which will be implemented this weekend to bring the ship into a non-commercial port. One major obstacle to that has been a shortage of testing kits and labs, something the U.S. president says is a thing of the past. But he seems less sure that the people on board the Grand Princess should be let off the ship at all. I mean, frankly, uh, if it were up to me, I would be inclined to say leave everybody on the ship for a period of time and you use the ship as your base. But a lot of people would rather do it a different way. They'd ra rather quarantine people in the land. For now, the thousands on board the Grand Princess are still out there somewhere. Officials say they'll all eventually be tested for COVID-19, but what's less clear is where their cruise will finally end. Aaron Collins, CBC News, San Francisco. One of the world's largest film, music, and tech festivals was set to get underway next week in Texas. But today, officials pulled the plug on South by Southwest due to the coronavirus. As Vilaka Natu explains, it joins a long list of cancellations sweeping the entertainment industry. This animation team is used to being in front of screens, but they need to get in front of buyers, too. This year, their best chance of that is now gone after the cancellation of the global MIP TV showcase in Cannes. It's always sad because it doesn't allow us to meet in person, which is still the best type of meeting you can get. The cancellation is just part of a huge hit to the entertainment world. With thousands of theaters in China closed, major films are moving release dates. Take the new James Bond film. Its premiere has been pushed to November from April. This is a bad idea. Some big productions filming in Europe are on hold, like Mission Impossible 7 and the reality show Amazing Race. And that's not all. Sony Pictures has temporarily closed three of its European offices. Disney Plus cancelled a major launch event in London. And the music business is reacting too. Heartbreak explosions. Singers like Canada's Avril Lavigne are pulling out of Asian tour dates. Even K-pop sensation BTS mixed hometown performances in Seoul. 
And in the U.S., a new petition calls for the cancellation of next week's big music, film and tech conference, South by Southwest, in Austin, Texas. It's still moving ahead, even though Twitter, Facebook, Netflix and Apple, among others, have pulled out. But the scaled down version has real world effects. The ecosystem of South by Southwest and the economic trickle down, it goes all the way down and it goes down to the folks, unfortunately, that need the work the most, need the money the most. Other festivals are also at risk, including the famed Cannes Film Festival. The French government has banned gatherings of more than 5,000 people in confined spaces till the end of May. I, I think that it's going to be a challenge to get all those contents from this year back in the markets and to get the exposure they were hoping to have in these, uh, these times. Meaning tough decisions and unpredictable consequences for artists the world over. Zuleika Nathu, CBC News, Los Angeles. 20 to 7 on this Friday evening, beautiful evening. It was uh, preceded by a nice sunny day here on the South Coast, and uh, apparently there's more of that to come. Brett's going to break down your weekend forecast next. The weather update is brought to you by The Body Shop that always takes you back to your happy place. BC's favorite, Craftsman Collision, Air Miles, and Bigger Smiles. All right, here we go. The weekend is upon us, and <laughs> you're talking about maybe snow in some parts? I know. It's hard to believe, and really, let's hmm. all be perfectly clear here. I don't have a lot of confidence in this, but I know <laughs> okay. that in... No, no, but I, I mean this seriously. I know that in Vancouver, if I didn't mention that there was the possibility yeah. for snow, and then it did snow, I would feel really bad about that. Good so point. I'm just going to cover our bases here, but really, the vast majority of this weekend, it's looking pretty all right. And I'm going to get into that right now, but let's take a look mm. at this morning. Wasn't it a beautiful day? I mean, just objectively beautiful. There were some clouds there. There there's a nice amount of sun. We can see them just really rising quite nicely over our North Shore Mountains. And as the day went on, yeah, that kind of just became the thing we were treated to throughout much of that time. And now, as we get into this evening hour, we're going to get into the overnight. Those clouds are going to start taking up more space in our sky. And that, of course, is going to be a little bit telling because of what's to come. This is what we were just mentioning about. There is just a slight chance tomorrow morning that we could be dealing with some snow or some mixing. But honestly, it's not going to be sticking around. We're 
still going to be getting up to temperatures that would be pretty well seasonal for this time of year so it's there so you're not going to be caught off guard i've warned you but hey if it doesn't happen then you just get to start enjoying your weekend a little bit earlier as the day goes on throughout saturday generally clearing it might not be com completely sunny but we will be looking at largely sunny conditions throughout sunday rather fitting wouldn't you say so we're not going to be expecting any significant precipitation at all throughout the day on sunday now temperatures all across the southern half of bc pretty well right where they should be so we're not looking at any extremes if anything is worth mentioning that parts of the lower mainland going to be a few degrees cooler than normal but really when we have sun in the sky right now it's feeling a lot warmer and i think it's going to be actually pretty nice that said with these changing temperatures that we've seen our avalanche danger rating essentially province-wide is pretty considerable so if you're going to be going out this out back country this weekend do be careful about that and if instead you want to take it a little bit more locally maybe you're going to go up to the north shore mountains and ski we are looking at pretty nice spring skiing conditions really only expect about a trace of snow on saturday but both sunday and monday there's going to be lots of sunshine it's going to be pretty nice spring skiing conditions and we're looking at our next round of snow coming more so onto tuesday now in terms of a five-day forecast once we get through our little bit of snow rain on saturday both sunday and monday are looking great tuesday is going to have a little bit of shower activity and that's going to last into wednesday but hey again temperatures pretty well where they should be all right looking pretty good thanks brett you're welcome A 14-year-old teen in Toronto has been returned home, shaken but otherwise unhurt. His abductors still on the loose. The reason he was taken next. A 14-year-old boy is back home with his parents tonight near Toronto. He was snatched from the streets as retribution against his half-brother. Retribution for a drug deal gone wrong. As Lorenda Redekop reports, his kidnappers are still on the loose, and so is the boy's half-brother. I just want to hug him first. Before anything else, I just want to hug him, let him know that he's loved. Reverend Sky Star can't wait to see the 14-year-old boy. She leads a young achievers group he's in. It met last night without him, when the Amber Alert was still in effect. See this black spot on the road? The Jeep he was forced into had already been found, torched in a rural area. 
first of all, we thought about canceling the group, and I said, no, you cannot cancel the group because these kids are, they're scared. A lot of them are upset or confused. They don't know what's happening. People were crying. Some of the advisors were crying. It's okay, and I'm saying everybody, hey, it's okay to cry. It's okay to feel. Hours later, news that he was found safe. And my gosh, everybody was jumping. I was crying. Everybody was crying. It was rejoicing, just happy, you know, that he was safe. The police chief says the teen was found in an abandoned barn near Brampton. He appeared to be disheveled at that time, was taken to a medical facility for a checkup. Um, he's now safe with his mom and dad, and uh, we have yet to interview him. Police haven't made any arrests. They say the boy was kidnapped because of a drug debt by his older stepbrother. A 100 kilo cocaine deal worth $4 million. The chief says police have had limited contact with the brother and don't know where he is. Right now, um, he, the role he would play is, is a witness and he would have a strong idea of who is involved and, and what the involvement was. Another side of this, the boy missed school Wednesday, but that wasn't reported to his parents until after 6 p.m. The school board investigation continues with four staff members on home assignment. A board spokesperson couldn't say how long that investigation might take, but he says it will include a larger look at how often attendance reports don't make it in on time. If that were my child, I would be in a state right now. She's thinking about his healing. What he has showed us in class is that he is, he has the resilience. I mean, we all have it, but he's got that. He's special. He's special. Yeah, and he's safe for a special reason. That says the police chief is appealing to anyone with more information about who's responsible. There are people, and this is who I'm appealing to, there are people out there that definitely know what went on. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. Well, this is probably not news to you. Canadians pay some of the highest prices in the world for cell phone plans, up to 40% more than Americans in some cases. Well, now, as Jacqueline Hansen tells us, the federal government says it has a plan of its own to slash cell phone bills for nearly half of Canadians. You're not ready for my phone okay, bill. Wow. In Canada, big cell phone bills are easy to find. My monthly bill is usually around 250. I was paying almost 400 a month. The federal Liberals campaigned on making them cheaper. A re-elected Liberal government will cut cell phone bills by 25 percent. We also have transparency measures. To now it's seeing that through. A government-imposed 25% price cut will apply to the big three carriers for plans of between 2 and 6 gigabytes. For example, the government says a 2 gigabyte plan that currently costs $50 per month would need to drop to $37.50. We anticipate this will benefit approximately 40% of Canadians. But in a statement, TELUS said it is extremely disappointing to see that the 25% decreases are limited to the national carriers. And Bell warned that policies discouraging investment, including regulating wireless pricing, put jobs and innovation at risk. But some consumer advocates believe Ottawa could have done more. Could they have done um, deeper cuts? Certainly. According to data released by the government, Prices have already been falling over the past couple of years. We expect them to be able to both handle these price reductions because they aren't really that difficult for them. And I don't believe they'll actually follow through and, and pull out their investments. And some Canadians' data demands already far exceed a six gigabyte plan. It's two to six gigs doesn't even sound like it. I would imagine that most people are, especially in the streaming world, going to be over that number. If the carriers don't meet the targets within two years, the government says it will consider other options, including taking steps to increase competition. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. It has been nearly two months since Iranian government forces shot down a Ukrainian airline's commercial flight, killing all 176 on board. Most were either Canadian citizens or people with ties here. Ashley Burke has the story of one family it says their grief and anger made them targets of the Iranian state. This grieving family says they were silenced by threats at home, so they came to Canada to be heard. They fled from Iran because they had no other choice. Their only tie to Canada, Amir Hossein Saidinia, their 25-year-old son, on his way to Alberta to start his PhD, when Iran shot his plane, Ukraine International Airlines Flight 752, 
out of the sky. Amir Hossein. We were all relying on him. He was like a mountain. Just imagine if you lose your highest hope. Amir Hossein's hope was to become a Canadian citizen and support his family, especially his little brother, who has autism and needs extra care. Members of the family say they challenged the Iranian regime. The mother captured on social media on the streets of their hometown in anguish, demanding answers. The family says the regime targeted Amir Hossein's aunt. The worst things that can happen to a, to a person within those 24 hours that they arrested me for, they did to me. She says Iran's Revolutionary Guard detained her, abused her and threatened her life. The family said they had no choice but to flee the country. With the help of some Iranians in Edmonton, they got a visitor's visa to Canada and arrived last week. I hope for them to get closure and I definitely want to see them safe. I would not want them to see, I don't want to see them go back and I believe every human being is entitled to safety and to justice. The family wants to stay here. If we are ever forced to go back to Iran, we're all going to have to commit suicide because there's nothing else left for us to do. They're calling on the Prime Minister for help. Canada says there must be justice for the victims of Flight 752. The family says they can only find that justice here in Canada. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, the pocket rocket, Henri Richard, has died. Coming up, we look back at the life of a legendary Montreal Canadian. Hi, I'm Amy Bell. Here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. On March 11th, you're invited to Racist, The Uncomfortable Truth, a free public town hall on racism at CBC Vancouver Studio 700. Join CBC Vancouver's Stephen Quinn, Anita Bath, and Michelle Elliott for a discussion on racism in the workplace, media, and day-to-day -day interactions. Seats are limited. Register at cbc.ca slash bc or listen on CBC Radio 1 and live stream on CBC Gem.
Henri Richard, the pocket rocket, a Montreal Canadiens legend and Hockey Hall of Famer, has died. Richard played for the Habs for 20 years, joining the team in 1955 when his bigger brother, Maurice Rocket Richard, was still playing and the league had just six teams. With his brother, while his brother rather, got more goals, Henri, the pocket rocket, was a brilliant playmaker. Playing center, he excelled at face-off, stick handling, and was a big part of 11 Stanley Cup winning teams, scoring two Cup winning goals. He retired in 1975. His jersey was raised to the rafters of the Montreal Forum. Richard was diagnosed with Alzheimer's five years ago. He's survived by his wife, five children, and their families. Henri Richard was 84. Just a reminder, you can always find this newscast online, cbc.ca slash bc. Our next local news is at 11 o'clock with Leanne Young tonight, right after the National. Have a great weekend. We'll see you again on Monday.